Good afternoon and a huge welcome to our grand lecture today with the positive optimistic title on the journey towards a circular economy. To all of you out there watching, thank you so much and a huge welcome to BlocksUp. It is a delight to have so many of you near and afar with us today. Our grand lecture consists of two segments. First, we have the deep dive of our science talks, and I'm delighted in just a few minutes or moments to introduce Bas van der Westerlo from CTT Expo Lab, joining us from Holland. And later, we'll have our Blocks Hub debates with six amazing people joining us to share with us an invigorating and intensive debates. So stay tuned and just a few practical notes. You are watching us on YouTube, and as most of you know, we have a chat function on the YouTube. It does require that you log in. I can only encourage you to do so and ask as many questions and comments as you want. We would love to have you with us in the chat. We are also active on the chat, so feel free to comment, ask questions, and then I will rejoin you later on stage here in a conversation with Bess, and we'll bring your questions with me to that conversation. Now, Bess, are you joining me? Yes, good afternoon, Penelope. Good afternoon, and Bess, such a huge thank you for taking time out and joining us today. I have looked so much forward to your talk. So I will step off the stage and give the word to you, and I'll rejoin you in approximately 45 minutes. And thank you again. Thank you, Panella. Thank you, BlocksUp, for this uh, great opportunity and organizing this event uh, around circular economy and the implementation of circular economy principles within the built environment. I'm uh, really looking forward, and also to the audience, uh, it's a pleasure meeting you in this way um, from Holland uh, to meet you. Hopefully, we will meet each other uh, quite soon um, physically. Um, during the next 45 minutes, I would like to talk about uh, some developments on circular economy within the built environment. Um, and as you will see on my screen, um, you will see one particular project, which is the City Hall Venlo project in the south of the Netherlands, uh, a project with it, which is realized uh, about four years ago in 2016. And I want to show with you and talk with you about the journey of this whole design process of incorporation of these cradle to cradle and circular principles into the design. Uh, but also uh, share with you the first results of having this project in, in, in use, uh, especially about the effect of circular principles on the, on the business case, uh, but especially as well on the productivity and the health aspect of the people working inside the building, although during the last couple of months, less than before, during this COVID-19 pandemic. But we have great results that I want to share with you on the effect of having this healthy building on uh, the people health and people uh, uh, behave within this, uh, this building. Um, as Panilla said, uh, please and feel free to have any comments or questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, so that we can answer this uh, on the end of, of, uh, of this science talk. Um, you will see me here uh, on the back side of the project, which we call the south facade, is the, the technical facade. Uh, the other one that we, uh, we saw already on the first sheet is the biological facade. So we both have a, um, a, 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 yeah, a technical and biological cycle within the building. Uh, as you can see, um, I work for the Cradle to Cradle Expo Lab. Uh, we are founded around, tw around 12 years ago and focusing on the built environment, on circular procurement, and also on uh, the strategic processes. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, which means that um, uh, we, uh, um, of course, have to make our own money, but uh, advisory work, consultancy, but also we invest in um, the new topics around circular economy that pops up, which uh, are the questions of tomorrow, and we want to answer them as well, so that we can make the transition 
uh, and speed them up uh, to, to have more implementation of, of, of these principles in, in future projects. Uh, so our ambition is to raise that bar all over um, and uh, to make more great uh, building projects uh, today and tomorrow. Um, and of course, we, as I said uh, and explained, we want to raise that bar as much as possible. So we are always ambitious and uh, want to go for the 100%. And um, in the meantime, we also realize that uh, the, the project has to be built as well. Um, so uh, we also always have to find a way in uh, being ambitious uh, compared with um, being pragmatic in a way and, and to see what is possible within the context of, for example, budget planning and the demands that are already there in, in the project. Um, but uh, what we will see is that, uh, that this is possible and these two worlds uh, absolutely can come together. Um, before I dive into uh, the practical examples, uh, I want to share this with you and maybe some of you will have seen it uh, before. Um, but this was a picture that um, convinced me around 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago, on the, um, the difference of a, a, a traditional linear sustainable solution and approach of being efficient, of trying to reduce uh, or minimize our negative footprint we have uh, on the environment. Um, and what cradle to cradle and circular economy is all about is to create a positive impact to be effective rather than efficient, um, or maybe in more simple words, uh, less bad is still no good. So we try to do uh, the right things instead of doing things right. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, uh, difference in the approach we can have. Um, so as I said, we, we, we try to go for having that positive impact and add value uh, within the projects. Um, in the meantime, that also means that, that we have to be consciously outside the lines, um, which I mean that, that we have to be aware that some of the people, maybe a lot of people, are still in that linear approach. And we have to take them by hand and show them, convince them the benefits of another approach. Um, so inspiring, uh, seduce and also help them around the, the road to, to make step forwards into this direction. Is, very important to make things happen. Uh, so we not only go into the, the broad uh, commitment we can, we can have in an organization or a project, but also the deep commitment that we try to find uh, within uh, the whole project teams. Um, I try to make this science talk as much as possible in a virtual tour. Uh, so I incorporated some videos on the buildings that, that, uh, that, that we will see. So this is the Venlo City Hall, uh, just to give you some uh, impressions of the building uh, during my talk. Um, as said, Venlo decided in 2007, 2008 already to build a new building, a new city hall, and they decided that that building should be 100% circular. A great ambition, a great vision, and only compliments to that, but I also have to be um, uh, honest with you, they hadn't any clue what they were deciding at that time. They had an idea of what a 100% circular building would mean, what it, how it, how it could look like, uh, how, the, how the whole process uh, would look like. Uh, but it gave us the opportunity to work together with the municipality to, to make that happen. Um, so again, compliments to, to the council deciding that at that time already. Um, so how we all started, and, I, and that's the same in, in Holland, it's the same in Denmark, and it's the same across the world, um, we have to tender, or a city has to tender, has to work with public procurement. And normally in a situation how it, how it would look like is that uh, the city would have a tender document and ask for the best design. Um, but we realized that there was no experience on circular building and circular circular um, um, experience at all um, within the sector. So we did an ask, an ask an other way of, of a tenor approach and we did not ask for a design, but we asked for a vision. So we asked um, all the architects and we had 53 architectural firms that wanted to do this job. And we asked them uh, to come up with a vision. 
in a couple of A4 papers to write down how they wanted to achieve this 100% circular ambition together with us, so together with the municipality. So one big example and, and advantage is that it will cost less time for the design teams, uh, but also a, a big advantage is that we became together a team realizing the whole design. So um, it was not already a design with, which was on the table, but we did it together. Um, and what we realized, although that we select all the design partners like architects, like advisors, um, uh, building managers uh, around the table, we came to the conclusion after a couple of weeks and months that the ambition of 100% was kind of declining. So we focused on uh, and we concluded that we had to focus on a couple of teams of areas. So one of my advices would be to always focus on a couple of teams, uh, areas that, that you want to focus on in your project. And for Venlo, this was um, important to have a building that that generates its own energy, not using any fossil fuels, but I think everybody will have an understanding on that. Uh, same counts about the water aspect. So how can the building purify its own water, reuse it again, etc. Uh, the third team was around the materials. So how can the building be a material depot, a material bank for the future, um, incorporating healthy materials, no toxic materials that are reused or reusable, um, that contains uh, maybe a residual value or uh, take-back schemes, uh, which I want to, talk, want to talk about later on. Uh, so at the end, a building that can be uh, disassembled and has no waste at the end. Um, and four, but definitely not the latest, is how can we create a building that is healthy, a building that has better indoor climate than outside, a building that purifies the air when it goes out so which is just like a tree having a positive impact on its surrounding. So basically these four teams are the, the, the storyline of, uh, of this building project of City Hall Venlo. But at the end, um, and that I think is really important of making this project a success, that it was not a, a given by the, the left-wing policy on making only the, uh, the, the, the the positive impact on the environment and the social aspect, but also the right-wing parties were involved on seeing this as an economical principle for economical local growth in the area and boost innovation that goes beyond the conventional sustainability. Um, so one aspect where I want to dive into is the circular materials. Um, also a very important topic of today during these sign talks. Um, and uh, what we always try to do is to involve these supply chain uh, members and not wait until the moment where we specify the whole design at the end of the design stage. But we early involved in a very early stage these companies and to talk with each other what, what is possible. And we want to challenge them as well, not only see what is already possible, but we want to challenge them how they can work with us together on, 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 high, on, on higher levels of circularity. And that gives them also the time to come up with more innovative solutions. Um, for example, when we sit around, the, sat around the table with these companies during the design stage, we still had one and a half to two years with these companies before the building should be built. Um, so it, it gave them as well a lot of time to come up with these better solutions and contribute to the ambitions that are already uh, described in my previous uh, slide. Um, so share these expectations and share your ambitions. I think really important to, to work on that together. Um, some questions that we always ask, and that brings me as well on, on uh, the subject of today of material passports and building passports is we always ask to the product composition. So what's in, basically, what's in your product? And I was still surprised that a lot of uh, companies were not, not able to answer that question right away. Um, so that took a lot of time. Uh, secondly, we work with them on, uh, for example, the origin. Where does it come from? But also, is it possible to recycle your product? Um, what's about the re reusability? Is it 
degradable. Um, so these kind of, of options we, we want to see and talk with. Um, and the companies that ans can answer these, these type of questions, um, you automatically, automatically come into the discussion of, for example, how could the business case look like? Uh, what about the demountability of your product? Uh, can you easily recycle that? Uh, do you have take-back schemes? And what about business modeling? Um, do you take in mind, for example, residual value? Um, can you work with other business models like leasing or buy with buyback scenarios? So very interesting to have these kind of talks with your supply chain uh, doing these processes. When I talk on this project of City Hall, I think we can conclude that a lot of cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified or equal products like that, uh, that so that are equal to this cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification uh, standard, uh, are used. Um, just for your knowledge, when we started all this in 2009, 2010, the design stage, we had the choice for five, less than five uh, of these materials. At the end, we do have now over 30 of these types of products. So, as I said, we work closely with them together to see how we can um, uh, challenge each other to, to bring us to a higher level. We also uh, had a, a good look at how can we reuse current materials in the building with one condition that these materials should be uh, not only circular but also healthy in a way and uh, in some cases like the concrete for example of the former building we have made the decision not to reuse it because we came to the conclusion that it was that there were toxic materials in it and with the ambition of making a healthy building um, yeah we decided not to do so um, as said, um, not all the products are already, were already there, are already there on the market that um, are in line with these principles. So we also have a kind of backup system that we can work with quick scans to showcase the potential of the products. So when the product is not there yet, we can see if it is in the, in the same road, the same ambitions as, 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 uh, as the, the ambitions of the project and work especially with these material passports where I will come back on later on um, to, to register, to document the, the quality and the quantity of these applied materials. And uh, what we did as well is to, to write down the dismantling plan so before realizing the building, we knew how to disassemble it again on, uh, on the end of the use time. So this is an example of uh, a material passport that we have used and that we still use today in, in, in a lot of other projects. So it tells you information about asset, the composition of the product that are used. Uh, it gives you insight on the origin, on the reusability, on the toxicity, uh, but also the potential of this assembly at the end of, of the use time, the technical or functional use time of the product. Um, so you see here um, uh, an example, and I think you can see my mouse uh, on the screen. Um, this product consists of 17 materials, and every material you, um, uh, you, you will know which material is in there. You will see the material safety, which means that it is a green light, a green button. And it doesn't contain any banned list products, um, and showing with it. Uh, showing a, 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 um, a red light when there are toxic materials in it, bad list products, or a, a yellow or a um, uh, um, yeah a, a yellow sign when um, there are uh, bad list products in it, but they are phased out in in short notice. Um, then we want to know the material source. So is it virgin? Is it recycled? As I explained, the the percentage of material source specified. The weight, and at the end, uh, you will you will have an insight on your input streams, your output streams. You know what you have, uh, and you will get um, circularity um, uh, data on your products. So that's what I call material passports, uh, having that insight on your products. Secondly, uh, which is in my opinion and another. Um, uh, Another way of passporting for your building is a building passport. Um, and you see here an example of that. Um, maybe some of you will recognize on the top of the screen, you will see the levels of rent 
from uh, the side structure to the stuff within a building. And on the left side, you will see the material families that we can recognize, like stone, like glass, like wood, like plastics. Uh, so working with BIM or uh, BIM models, or you can also work with some Excel uh, uh, sheets uh, if, if needed, uh, you will get insight on the quantitative aspect of your building in your, in your building passport. Um, very, uh, uh, very good to have that insight for future uh, reusability, reusing products and to prevent waste at the end of, 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 of the whole uh, uh, project lifespan. Um, the benefit is that you always will get, will get a circularity index um, and give you insight in the residual value. Um, and I want to go a little bit into that, that aspect of residual value. Um, as you see here, um, knowing what you have uh, can make an estimation on the value of your project during the, the next, let's say, 40 years uh, when we talk about the City Hall of Fenlo. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example, so not, uh, not for the City Hall, but you can prevent uh, or make an expectation of the value of your products. But this is not on product level uh, or element level, this is on the raw material level. Uh, so actually, when we see the, the ways of, of, of the, the, the reuse, recycling, uh, reduce, this is only on the, on the recycling rate. Um, during the project of City Hall, we had these interesting talks with the supply chain. And for example, uh, we had to do a, a specific tender for the furniture. And um, we, we concluded that this, this sector was already there in, in making a lot of steps into the direction of circularity. So we were quite confident of asking these questions to the market. Um, and we talked about um, the questions we already talked about, like what's in your product? How do you work with certifications? But we also talked about the topic of residual value. So on the left side, or on the right side for you, uh, you will see the awarding criteria that we used during this public tender. Um, we asked for a vision, which was only 10% of the total score. So we wanted to select a right partner that wanted to team with us, to team up, to, to come up to the best uh, innovations and the best um, uh, fulfillment of, of our ambitions. Uh, secondly, we work with the cradle-to-cradle -cradle footprint. So let's say a cradle-to-cradle -cradle or circular footprint, which was a knockout criterion, which means that we wanted to have insight on the products that, that they want, wanted to use. So uh, when certified, you would have a 100% score on that specific uh, product. If not, we requested the market to fill in uh, a form, uh, a passport, uh, on giving insight on, on the product. When not reaching a level of amount of, of, of points, you would be out of competition. So it was definitely one of the most important uh, awarding criteria. Then third, we had focus on the, the budget. So on the total cost of ownership, and we said the total cost of usage. Um, because Fanlo uh, didn't want to own their products, these products of furniture, they wanted to use it for a period of 10 years. So we came up with a solution to, um, uh, to work with, uh, to buy with a buyback scenario uh, that was possible within the tender. And then finally, the aesthetics, with, uh, which was also 30% of the awarding criteria. So then the results, again, we had really high quality of products with really great economic uh, uh, um, fulfillment. So um, we even had better quality products than we expected and we asked for in the in the program of requirements and uh, the wishes that we had on, on that topic. We also had very high level of cradle to cradle certified or equal uh, products. So everywhere, wherever possible, we, um, we well, uh, we can, they come up, the market came up with, with these type of products. And something that we, we really were surprised on was the residual value. Um, so within the, the, the boundary conditions of the budget, um, we, um, uh, we well the, the market came up with 18% residual value, which means that the city of Fenlo will have around 300,000 euros back at the end of the 10-year uh, contract 
so six years from now on, um, that they will get back on, on these materials when they decide not to use it for a longer period. And also the supplier said, wait, we uh, realize that we, we will return our own products. So you, Venlo, will not do the maintenance. We will do that for you. Normally you will pay 50,000 euros for that. Uh, but because these become our own products again, we will do this for you and you don't have to pay for that. So a lot of win-win situations. Um, that inspired us as well to go more into that direction of residual value. And we had a lot of talks, as already explained, with, with the supply chain. And we saw a lot of cases, a lot of producers that were interested in, in going into that direction uh, with us. Um, and if we try to summarize that, and we work very closely with TNO, um, uh, uh, which is a research institute in the Netherlands, and maybe some of you will have heard of, uh, we did that within a climate kick uh, project. And we dived into the topic of residual value in the building, building sector. And we started with dividing walls. And secondly, we had focused on, um, on, on the building facades. And we see on average, so to summarize, that somewhere between the 5 and the 40, maybe also 60%, um, we realized already today on residual value on product level. So when you only focus on the raw material, and that's how I started uh, a couple of slides ago, when you only have focus on the raw material, then you will somewhere come up with three to four, maybe five percent of your building costs in residual value. Uh, the potential is much higher uh, focusing on, on, as I said, more the elements and the components within the building. Uh, so for example, we, we made agreements on uh, residual value on the building facade till 61%. So the potential, you have to think about it, is of course enormous. Um, and we have to go more into that. Uh, we are definitely not there yet, but this is a really nice movement that um, is, is really interesting, I think. Um, next to that, because calculating residual value on a product is one thing, uh, you also have to embed that in your organization. Uh, for example, at a city um, or Venlo, how to incorporate that. So the scenario two that you see here on the screen is in most of the times is, is, is the case where there is no policy around residual value. Um, so it has to come from the project, the project team, the project manager to incorporate residual value in the product, uh, sorry, in the project. And then you will come up with some examples with guaranteed amount in euros on residual value. But at the end, because it's no policy in the end of, of the project, it will return in the, the cash flows, in the, in the, in the value streams of, um, of the municipality or the, the client, um, and will go back to the, the general means of the organization. So we want to go towards scenario one, where residual value comes into the policy, for example, the investment policy of the organizations where um, uh, residual value is the starting point of the project. will go into the purchasing team, the tender documents within the applications, of credit applications. And by doing so, again, you will come up with um, uh, um, agreements on residual value with producers. Um, and it will be part of your administrations, which means that you can calculate the residual value within your project and it will go into the monitoring system per project. And so by doing so, um, you could have benefits also in the, in the, in the short term on uh, working with residual value. Um, so we also dived into when do you incorporate residual value uh, in such a way? And um, I don't want to go into this uh, very specifically, uh, but you can see that we need a lot of disciplines from procurement to the suppliers, legal, finance, you have to incorporate them on the whole uh, system. And definitely in the first phase of your project, uh, till the, the definitive phase of your product, is really, really necessary to work very closely with each other uh, to, to work on, on that. Um, so for Venlo, imagine if we if we succeeded in five percent residual value, which is 
Not very much, uh, as you can imagine. That would mean an extra 80,000 saving every year on the building costs. So also here the potential is, is enormous. Um, I want to go into another subject. Um, as I said, the health aspect is, is really important for a lot of projects and also for um, the city of Venlo, it was one of the main teams. So how can we make not only a circular, but also a, a, a healthy building? And just some food for thought, uh, what do you think, how many percentage of your time are you indoor? Not only uh, now today during this COVID-19 period, but in general. So in general, this is 19%. So a lot of time we are investing inside the building. And if we realize that a building um, is four to eight times, eight times worse in air quality than outside, it's something to think about. Also, maybe just another question, and I can ask you lots of these type of questions, but of the 82,000 chemicals we use for commercial purpose, how many percent do you think has no data for health? It's something I surprised really, it's more than 85% but we do not have the data on health. So I, I said we can go on with these kind of, 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 of topics, but as I explained, we, we wanted to create a building that has a positive impact, both on the interior and the outside air. Um, so this building again, going back to the city hall, uh, and again, I hope you will see my, my, uh, my mouse. On the right side, we will have a big greenhouse top. Uh, topping. So this is actually the, the lung of the building. That's the place where the outside air is inhaled to the inside. There is green, there are trees, there is water. So we uh, try to bring the, 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 the air quality on the right temperature and, and humidity and so on. Then this, this purified air will go to the garage um, and we will use the mass of the building during winter and summer times to heat or cool that uh, indoor, indoor air. And then we will uh, have an open system behind this glass uh, wall. There is a big void structure, an open structure, which is in connection with a solar chimney on top of the building. So actually we have a natural flow from the greenhouse to the basement and then go back to the solar chimney. Uh, so we only have a natural system here. Um, we only have chemical, sorry, uh, a mechanical um, uh, ventilations in the in the offices uh, um, that has no direct connection to the system. Um, by doing so, and we can include that now in in, um, in these four years of, of, of uh, being in use, that the indoor climate today is better than outside. So something to think about. Normally, on average, in office buildings, the inside air is four to eight times worse than outside. In this building, the inside air is better than outside. That's that's quite interesting and quite uh, uh, a success. And also, by having this system with a solar chimney, we don't want to push that, that air uh, going out here on top of the building, but we push that, um, that, that air between the wall and the green wall and there are some openings within the green wall. Uh, so this green wall purifies the air from the inside when it goes to the outside. And also there we have measurements around the building. We can now conclude that this building purifies over 30% in a radius of 500 meter around the building, 30% uh, of fine dust and CO2. So just like the ambition, this building is really a tree for its surrounding. It looks nice, at least in my opinion, um, it, it creates uh, biodiversity. It is good for um, uh, the heat stress within the surrounding uh, and, and there are lots of more uh, benefits of, of doing it this way. So again, a building with, with clean, healthy indoor and uh, outdoor air. Um, so something I want to go a little bit more into detail on is, is that aspect of the measurement of, of all this. Um, because it's nice to, to, to tell that, but I also want to 
to have the confidence that this is really the case. So we asked the University of Maastricht, together with Aachen in Germany and Berkeley, to work with us on, on, on this. So we teamed up with uh, 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 organizations, both on the Dutch and the German border. And um, what the University of Maastricht did is to doing a survey in the former building of the city. So the, the former city hall. Uh, so that was in 2016 in the summer of July of 2016. And 200, 30, 630 people, participants, did, uh, worked on that survey. Um, and 70% of these people moved to the new building, so to the new city hall. And 30% uh, is still in the same building as they were on 2016 and on forehand. Um, so scientifically, uh, a perfect um, um, uh, possibility to compare um, apples with apples to compare the employees of the same organizations in two types of different buildings, a former building and a new building. Some of the conclusions that we that we can see now today is that there is indeed um, a, a, a difference in how people um, feel themselves in within these types of buildings. So, for example, the air quality is, is absolutely better than it was before. We can Prove that now with the data on the measurement. So we measure temperature, humidity, uh, fine dust, CO2 levels, and so on. But also we can now conclude that the people experience that the employees more, pre more um, uh, present, uh, better than, than it was before. We can also see that and conclude that for temperature, we can see that for light, and we see that the noise aspect is quite the same as it was before, which was quite surprising because in the former building, they work in offices for two or maybe three colleagues, and now they work in a open space, uh, an open office area. Uh, so still we see that there is no difference in noise uh, in how people uh, feel themselves in that situation. What we also can see is that the level of percentage of people that are reporting on sick building syndrome aspects is almost half since um, uh, since they moved to the new building. So we definitely see that this has effect on the people. Um, uh, and we can also see that, and I go back for, for one sheet, is that we see that into the numbers of, for example, the level of productivity, but also the sick rates. So since 2016, yes, so four years now, the sick rates is declined with, uh, reduced with one to one and a half percent. So that's enormous. So that's why we work together with these universities to see if this is um, uh, uh, really, well, what's the reason for this? Um, so imagine that this is the case and that we can make that, uh, make to prove that, that every year, every percent is about 480,000 uh, euros per year that you're saving on your personnel costs. So that's enormous. Um, and that brings me to the uh, final aspect of, of my presentation is also the business case. Um, for this project, uh, again, for the City Hall project, we had a budget of uh, 43 million euros, which is, during the benchmark, um, a, a normal uh, budget for a type of this kind of building. So not an extra budget for making it green or sustainable or circular. So it was a, just a normal benchmark. This building is built in the time of uh, an economical crisis and Venlo had to cut in their budget with over 20 million euros. This was the biggest project so you can imagine um, the question was how can we save money by doing less on sustainability. Um, so we calculated because that was our uh, um, assignment, we calculated what can we save by not doing it? And we concluded that by just simply cut a lot of sustainable and circular measures, we could save 3.4 million euros. And I will be honest with you, I think if we would show that uh, business case or the savings, the council um, would be really happy with that and could, could have a, a round of applause and said a big thank you, and, uh, and which would mean a big, a big saving on the, on the total 20 million euros. 
But of course, and I think you will have the same feeling as we did, is that when we do that, we will have no ambitions on circularity and sustainability anymore within the project, but it will have also a negative effect on the total business case. So we show them what the 3.4 million measures, like we see here on the screen, what that should mean on the total savings on the building. And then we see on the right side that in a result after 40 years, um, so after 40 years, which was the, uh, the use time uh, written in the policy, you would save 16.9 million euros just by investing in the right things. So we showed them these calculations within the council meeting and they said, well, thank you. Very interesting. We see a good payback time in 15 years. Well, actually, uh, 15 years may be a little bit too long, but the return on investment, which is which is good with 12 and a half percent, but still um, thank you for, for all your work. But uh, well, we have to focus on the short term. So we're going to cut the 3.4 million uh, uh, measures. So that's what actually happened. So when we walked out the building and out the meeting room, uh, we said, well, that was it. Uh, that was the end of, of our journey making a circular building like this. But we also concluded that we thought they don't understand what, what they decided. So two weeks later in the same council, another meeting, we came back with the same numbers and the only thing we added was also a cash flow calculation. And we showed them that, and we told them, if you invest in the 3.4 million euro measures, you have to pay your interest, like you and me uh, having a home, uh, paying interest uh, for, your, for your house. Um, and and that, that mortgage, that um, uh, um, amount of money every year was about 220,000 euros. 225 more or less but the saving on your cash flow on your uh, exploitation costs are around the same uh, number so you see in the first year a minus 9000 euros but after the first year we saw already a plus so actually we, we could say you don't have to leave anything uh, when you're investing in the 3.4 but you will start saving money from the first year on uh, and you will save 16.9 million euro during the total uh, lifespan of the building. And also this was really a, um, a safe calculation. So without a lot of high indexes and so forth. We also didn't include anything on residual value like we talked about. So we could have incorporated the 5% or more, uh, but we didn't do that. We haven't included the aspect of health in this. Um, I said 1% is 480,000 euros. So we explained that the business case could only be better than it is, as you see here on the screen. And by showing this, um, at the end, the council decided unanimously to work with this, so to go on with this. Uh, and I think a key moment in, in, in making it happen and working around uh, uh, the clock with this um, uh, with the whole uh, team of, of in, uh, inspiring people and companies. Um, and I can also tell you that now four years uh, being in use, we did a, a, a calculation uh, last year and we see that this business case and practice is even better than we, uh, we have it here on the screen. So we start saving money for Venlo already in the first year, uh, not with a minus 9,000, but with a plus 60,000 again, without having uh, calculations on residual value or health. Um, so to conclude, uh, and that brings me to the last uh, slide, um, a great journey of working together with, with a, a very big radius of, of, of companies and organizations and making this happen. And we didn't have the knowledge at that time where it would end. Um, and we, as this quote is saying, we don't see the whole staircase, but we took the first step. Um, so I, I'm looking forward and I'm looking forward to the discussion as well, uh, making these steps. And I know you're, you're making steps in Denmark, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, and to see how we can raise that bar uh, in every project more and more. And that, that, um, that's, that brings me energy and um, that, that makes it great and working in this field 
of expertise. So thank you for that. Um, maybe there are some questions, Penilla. Um, looking forward to answer them. Uh, and yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, Bess, and what a wonderful presentation. And we, I almost thought that you had a clock with seconds on it because you finished your, your talk just exactly as we had arranged. So thank you for that. And thank you for those of you uh, watching and participating. You have been very active in the chat and that is most welcome. So I have some wonderful questions for you, Bess, and I will literally just take as many as uh, time allows. Is that okay with you? It's perfect. Excellent. We have from Franz Leurenk uh, the nice question, how can you create an interesting business cake for co companies who are not interested in taking back materials? It's a good question, um, and indeed, um, there are, I think, multiple ways in, 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 in doing that. Um, I think it, it all starts with, um, do, you, do you want to work on circular products uh, here? So what, what does, what does the, the product contain? Um, is, is, it, is it circular in itself? And it, I think it's not necessary that the same company has to take back the products at the end of the, of the technical or the, the functional lifespan. Um, so we also see, for example, business uh, business modelings with a buy uh, scenario where a third party uh, make the agreements already in the first stage that they will 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 buy it at the end. So it's actually a combination of of, of more uh, uh, organisations in the sector. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't think it, it's, it's definitely necessary. Uh, it's an option to have a buy buy back scenario. Uh, but there are more options for that, yes. How to define healthy based on what rules? I actually look, it's a good question, I think. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, that's something which is, of course, um, we, we were wondering as well. Uh, and that is the reason why we started uh, the Healthy Building Network. Um, I will share with you later on the link. Uh, to this website of Healthy Building Network, um, uh, where we try to team up with organizations like universities, like I told uh, in my talk, um, uh, to make more definitions around that and to have more metrics and, and KPIs on that. Um, for Venlo, we defined some of these topics. So I explained in the beginning, we had four aspects, so four focus areas, so energy, water, materials, and health. And every um, area had its own roadmap. So we um, uh, tried to um, make every team, every area as smart and specific as possible. So we made KPIs and, and criteria around CO2, humidity, um, uh, um, TVOCs, uh, um, uh, finders, um, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, I think five or six of, of these uh, uh, criteria. Yeah. To Franz asking the question, I also know that Joseph Allen and John McComber that we interviewed in September, they also have criteria on healthy buildings and they would concur with your point best that a healthy building can actually be attributed to increased performances and well-being of the people in the building. So very in agreement with what you have been presenting. And we have a question from Jesper Ring. Did you, the suppliers, or Circular IQ confirm the input in the material passport? A nice question. Again, all good questions today. <laughs> um, yes, we, we, it, 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 it was, you know, Venlo um, embraced the cradle to cradle principles. Um, uh, so, circular economy was not there yet. Um, and I think. Um, uh, the cradle of cradle to cradle for us was was this project that I just explained. So we this was also for us the first time in 2009, 2010 of asking these types of questions. Uh, so working with these material passports, um, uh, we 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 asked them these set of, of of questions, and we had the opportunity to have a third party to check if whether the 
the input that we that we got from them if they were right. So that was kind of a, a, an, an, an extra control on that uh, that we were on the, on the right on the right page on the same page mm. uh, as, as as everybody. A nice follow-up question from Emma Elbeck. How do you gather the information for the material passports? Any challenges that you'd like to share? That's a nice follow-up to, to, to Jesper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's important and I think both also the architect but also uh, the construction companies uh, play a very important role in that. It is, um, as I explained also, uh, involve the supply chain on an early stage. Yeah. Um, just by asking the right questions. So um, by, by working working with, with these uh, formats of, of material passporting, uh, it's about asking these questions. Um, and it's then for the suppliers um, to fill in these kind of forms and to come up with, uh, with, the, with the right answers. Um, and, and in line with the, with the previous question, uh, of course, you, you have to be in control on that, you have to make sure that, that what is said is right. Mm -hmm. um, but that gives the opportunity com to compare apples with apples and to see um, how you can uh, evaluate that uh, within the same uh, product uh, category mm -hmm. and also to um, uh, yeah to register that for, for the future. And I think again, Franz Leurink, thank you for some excellent questions you're posing. Is there a connection between the material and the CO2 output that the material produces itself? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, normally not. Um, so within the normal uh, way of, of asking these set of criteria and questions, is, it's not part. But there is an option to include that. So, um, for example, we did uh, recently uh, some tenders on more the civil uh, works or roads and, and, and uh, uh, bicycle roads and, and also a bridge. And there we included also the CO2 levels uh, in this building passport. Sorry, the material passport. Mm. And to those of you watching, the procurement and the policy making is something that we'll actually return to in the debate. So it's uh, nice that you're also linking it to that. I also observed that during your presentation, you talked a lot about or addressed the importance of um, the time frame in terms of close collaboration that the earlier the various actors in this complicated process are involved, the better. And France, France also actually picked up on that and has asked, uh, were the users of the building, were they also included in the beginning from the start, as you said that the various uh, suppliers and contractors were? Yeah, France had a very good questions uh, today. Um, uh, not really, of course. Um, well, how, how would I answer? Well, we, we have chosen for deep commitment, um, which means that we wanted to be on the same page with the decision makers. Yeah. Um, so imagine the council, the aldermen, um, uh, the, the team leaders. So that's that's the people we 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 were really worked on together to yeah. to to make the steps on that. But of course, we also had more than thousand employees. And it is not possible to, to bring them around the table uh, uh, for that, but we, we guided them uh, uh, and, and to explain about, about our ambitions. And maybe funny to tell here is that, uh, and also especially of not only the employees, but also the surroundings. So the inhabitants of Fenlo, for example, they, they were kind of uh, negative in the beginning. And maybe that's something uh, um, uh, Dutch. But um, we, we, we said, uh, they said, well, why are they investing uh, 50 million euros in a new building? Uh, what's wrong with the old one? But when we start explaining them the story that I've just told, and when the building was there, they became more the ambassador of, of this building. And we see now today that over 40,000 people, so not from Venlo, but from, uh, especially from not Dutch people, I came to Venlo to see the the the, uh, the building and to have a guided tour, for example. Of course, not during the last couple of months, 
So it's, it's also uh, telling the story and, and making people more enthusiastic about it. I can share it's not only a Dutch reaction to be negative towards uh, change. I think it's universal in the, the human nature. But it is interesting to see the transition of, of uh, concern and potential reluctance to, to later embracement. I think Jesper Ring, and similar to that, Franz has also asked in terms of the comparison, collecting the performance data. Jesper Ring actually writes very, again, excellent question. You compare the new building with the old one. How does it compare to other modern office buildings when asking the users? Yeah, and, and then it's especially about the health aspect, of course, right? Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so we, we use the same uh, monitoring systems in the old, uh, so the current buildings and the new building. Uh, but we also compare, well, not we as C2C Expo Lab, but the University of Maastricht, for example, with um, uh, schools, so education, uh, other office buildings. So also then we, we can conclude with the data we have from the new city hall that there is always a improvement uh, on people, how they behave in a building or how they feel when they move towards a new building. Uh, so there, are, uh, there is knowledge around that. Above all that, we see the extra one to one and a half percent uh, on, for example, the sick rates that is reduced, like I explained before. So yes, um, it's not only comparing the old with the new, it's also comparing old and new uh, set, uh, uh, city of Venlo with comparable offices or even education, for example, uh, with the data. Interesting. Fats has two questions, but I'm going to keep one of them. The one goes to the responsibility of the producers regarding the material passport, but I think we're going to finish on one of the questions because I also wanted to ask you that one. What are the biggest lessons learned of this project? Yeah, good question, and, and, and a question that has often uh, been asked. Um, if, if, we, if, if we had the opportunity to do this again uh, for the same uh, uh, city, um, there would be some things that we would do different, and there are some things that are absolutely key factors. And I think the most important thing is that we started, so that's a key lesson of um, uh, work from an ambition and a vision. So first make make your vision clear uh, for yourself, uh, for your commitment internally, but also for uh, for the rest of, of your supply chain and, and, and people you're going to work with. Um, secondly, uh, circular procurement is a big enabler uh, to, to make that happen. And I think we will go on with that during the debate afterwards, uh, but circular procurement is a big opportunity to, to, to make that happen. And, um, then, of course, also, and I, I leave it to that if, if it's about the, the, the key moments, is the business case. Um, for us, that was a key moment to, to make it happen. Otherwise, we won't have a building like that. Yeah. On the other side, um, and I think that's also a big lesson learned, is our first ambition was how can we make from the old building the new building? So can we reuse the old materials into the new building? And I think that's a great idea of within a circular economy, but we came to the conclusion that they were really, like I said, uh, very briefly toxic in the old old concrete. Um, so that would be something we wanted to work on more closely for future projects. Mm -hmm. How can we do that in a right, right way? Um, uh, I think that's I, a very, very interesting point. And we'll certainly pick it up on the debate because we have... Uh, XN with us that have the whole criteria of design to disassembly. So I think that is a very good point and a reflection to, to finish on. I know, Bas, if you were here and we had the viewers with us physically, you would be met with such a round of applause right now. It has been absolutely amazing and a deep dive into City Hall in a way that we could not have imagined. And as much as I look forward to it, you have by far exceeded my uh, anticipation. So thank you so very much. To you watching, again, thank you for participating. We're going to give you a more than deserved break. You have time to stretch your legs, maybe freshen up on your coffee or get another snack. We will reconvene here with the debate. 
in about 30 minutes. So thank you to you as well. It has been such a pleasure and we will return shortly. Stay with us in 30 minutes. Thank you. See you soon.